freedom. We have said that the grand premise of religion is that man is able to surpass himself. Such ability is the essence of freedom. According to Hegel, the history of the world is nothing more than the progress of the consciousness of freedom. Now what gives us the assurance that freedom is not a specious concept? By the term freedom, we mean the will's independence of antecedent conditions, psychological and physiological. Yet, is the will ever independent of the character of the person, or the circumstances of the environment? Is not every action the result of an antecedent factor? Is not the present moment in which a decision is made loaded with the pressure of the past? The ability of the mind to compare the reasons for and against a certain action, and to prefer one against the other, does not extend beyond the scope of those reasons which are conscious and apparent. Yet these reasons are derived from other reasons which in turn have an infinite genealogy. Whatever the genesis of the original reasons may have been, facing the descendants is not an act of unbiased, undetermined thinking. Can we really claim to possess the power over the determinations of our own will? Who is to be regarded as free? Free is not always he whose actions are dominated by his own will. Since the will is not an ultimate, an isolated entity, but rather determined in its motivations by forces which are beyond its control. Nor is he who is free what he wants to be, since what a person wants to be is obviously determined by factors outside him. Is he who does the good for its own sake to be considered free? But how is it possible to do good for its own sake? How then is personal freedom possible? Its nature is a mystery and the formidable area of cumulative evidence for determinism makes it very difficult for us to believe in freedom. And yet, without such a belief, there is no meaning left to the moral life. Without taking freedom seriously, it is impossible to take humanity seriously. From the viewpoint of naturalism, human freedom is an illusion. If all facts in the physical universe, and hence also in human history, are absolutely dependent upon, and conditioned by causes, then man is a prisoner of circumstances. There can be no free, creative moments in his life, since they would presuppose a vacuum in time or a break in the series of cause and effect. Man lives in bondage to his natural environment, to society, and to his own character. He is enslaved to needs, interests, and selfish desires. Yet to be free means to transcend nature, society, character, needs, interests, desires. How then is freedom conceivable? The reality of freedom, of the ability to think, to will, or to make decisions beyond physiological and psychological causation, is only conceivable if we assume that human life embraces both process and event. If man is treated as a process, if his future determinations are regarded as calculable, then freedom must be denied. Freedom means that man is capable of expressing himself in events beyond his being involved in the natural process of living. To believe in freedom is to believe in events, namely to maintain that man is able to escape the bonds of the processes in which he is involved and to act in a way not necessitated by antecedent factors. Freedom is the state of going out of the self, an act of spiritual ecstasy in the original sense of the term. Who then is free? The creative man who is not carried away by the streams of necessity, who is not enchained by processes, who is not enslaved to circumstances. We are free at rare moments. Most of the time we are driven by a process. We submit to the power of inherited character qualities or to the force of external circumstances. Freedom is not a continual state of man, a permanent attitude of the conscious subject. It is not. It happens. Freedom is an act, an event. We are all endowed with the potentiality of freedom. In actuality, however, we only act freely in rare creative moments. Man's ability to transcend the self, to rise above all natural ties and bonds, presupposes further that every man lives in a realm governed by law and necessity as well as in a realm of creative possibilities. 
It presupposes his belonging to a dimension that is higher than nature, society, and the self, and accepts the reality of such a dimension beyond the natural order. Freedom does not mean the right to live as we please. It means the power to live spiritually, to rise to a higher level of existence. Freedom is not, as is often maintained, a principle of uncertainty, the ability to act without motive. Such a view confounds freedom with chaos, free will with the freak of unmotivated volition, with subrational action. Nor is freedom the same as the ability to choose between motives. Freedom includes an act of choice, but its root is in the realization that the self is no sovereign, in the discontent with the tyranny of the ego. Freedom comes about in the moment of transcending the self, thus rising above the habit regarding the self as its own end. Freedom is an act of self-engagement of the spirit, a spiritual event. The basic issue of freedom is how we can be sure that the so-called events are not disguised aspects of a process, or that creative acts are not brought upon by natural developments of which we are not aware. The idea of creative possibilities and the possibility of living spiritually depend upon the idea of creation and man's being more than the product of nature. The ultimate concept in Greek philosophy is the idea of the cosmos, of order. The first teaching in the Bible is the idea of creation. Translated into eternal principles, cosmos means fate, while creation means freedom. The essential meaning of creation is not the idea that the universe was created at a particular moment in time. The essential meaning of creation is, as Maimonides explained, the idea that the universe did not come about by necessity, but as a result of freedom. Man is free to act in freedom and free to forfeit freedom. In choosing evil, he surrenders his attachment to the spirit and forgoes the opportunity to let freedom happen. Thus, we may be free in employing or in ignoring freedom. We are not free in having freedom. We are free to choose between good and evil. We are not free in having to choose. We are, in fact, compelled to choose. Thus, all freedom is a situation of God's waiting for man to choose. The decisive moment in the message of the prophets is not the presence of God to man, but rather the presence of man to God. This is why the Bible is God's anthropology, rather than man's theology. The prophets speak not so much of man's concern for God, as of God's concern for man. At the beginning is God's concern. It is because of his concern for man, that man may have a concern for him, that we are able to search for him. In Jewish thinking, the problem of being can never be treated in isolation, but only in relation to God. The supreme categories in such ontology are not being and becoming, but law and love, justice and compassion, order and pathos. Being, as well as all beings, stands in a polarity of divine justice and divine compassion. To most of us, the abstract static principle of order and necessity is an ultimate category and one which is inherent in the very concept of being, or of our consciousness of being. To the Jewish mind, order or necessity is not an ultimate category, but an aspect of the dynamic attribute of divine judgment. Jewish thinking furthermore claims that being is constituted, created, and maintained not only by necessity, but also by freedom, by God's free and personal concern for being. The divine concern is not a theological afterthought, but a fundamental category of ontology. Reality seems to be maintained by the necessity of its laws. Yet, when we inquire, why is necessity necessary? There is only one answer. The divine freedom, the divine concern. The question may be asked, is it plausible to believe that the eternal should be concerned with the trivial? Should we not rather assume that man is too insignificant to be an object for his concern? The truth, however, is that nothing is trivial. What seems infinitely small in our eyes is infinitely great in the eyes of the infinite God. Because the finite is never isolated, it is involved in countless ways in the course of infinite events. 
and the higher the level of spiritual awareness, the greater is the degree of sensibility to and concern for others. We must continue to ask, what is man that God should care for him? And we must continue to remember that it is precisely God's care for man that constitutes the greatness of man. To be is to stand for, and what man stands for is the great mystery of being his partner. God is in need of man.